Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Siege of Vrax. Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex had dropped quite the bombshell on the still somewhat confused Marshal Kagori, but for us to get a better idea of what's happening, we should take a little bit of a trip back in time to when Hector Rex first began planning to subsume the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army into the ranks of Ordo Malus. And it all started during an official gathering of the Conclave of Scarus, the inquisitorial gathering that determines many of the more high-ranking questions of inquisitorial importance within a sector. And in amongst all the varied decisions that such a body must take a position to, the excommunication of certain Imperial individuals, the further investigation of other official personnel, etc., there was a one item on the docket of particular importance. The request made by Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex to introduce the 88th Imperial Guard Krieg Siege Army into the ranks of the Inquisition's servants, and specifically into the service of Hector Rex. Now, of course, simply just taking over command of the 88th was entirely within the Lord Inquisitor's judicial purview, but such a massive and unilateral move on behalf of a single Inquisitor without at the very least first consulting the Conclave would be considered dangerous. Inquisitors may have unlimited power, but there are several other Inquisitors just like them, and if an Inquisitor is seen to marshal a bit too much in the way of personal power, especially without a good cause, then other Inquisitors may start to question his loyalties, and within the ranks of the God Emperor's Most Holy Inquisition, Nothing is more dangerous than a loss of confidence. In this case, however, Lord Hector Rex seemed to have some fairly solid justifications for his request. A famous warp seer and scryer of the future named Malifus had predicted uh, that the Siege of Vrax uh, would soon enter into a new and highly disturbing phase. Uh, where the forces of the ruinous powers would take a more direct hand in guiding the war, with the eventual aim of turning the entire planet into a demon world. If this was allowed to happen, not only would all of the armies on Vrax quite obviously be lost forever, it would also open up a literal portal to hell in the middle of the Skara sector. This would, unsurprisingly, be an exceedingly undesirable outcome, since not only would it grant the traitors a safe port in the Skara sector, it would also become a point of transit between Vrax and the Eye of Terror. The planet would be turned into a near unassailable fortress, a strong point of chaos influence and a festering wound within the fabric of the Imperium. Destroying it would make the Siege of Vrax look like child's play, because no mere Imperial Guard regiment would ever suffice to take on a demon-infested planet. Only the might of the Adeptus Astartes, deployed in multi-chapter strength, led by the most sacred of warrior orders of the Grey Knights, could ever even hope to cauterize the wound and stop the bleeding. And even if such a force could be gathered, if multiple Astartes chapters could be formed up, if a major commitment from the Grey Knights could be acquired, and even further support elements of Imperial Guard, Titan, and Navy resources could be marshaled, it would still be a question of decades before the planet could be secured, even by the most optimistic of estimates. Nothing short of a crusade level force would have any real chance of ever reclaiming Vrax. 
This meant that the only truly realistic scenario was for a massive Imperial Navy force to be gathered with which the system could be broken open and the ultimate sanction of exterminatus carried out upon the planet. But frankly, the Scarus Sector was not likely to be able to marshal such forces, and certainly not swiftly. The only real chance, Hector Rex argued, was to strike now, and prevent the disaster before it was allowed to fully manifest. This notion immediately gained loud and vocal support from an organization within the Inquisition that Lord Hector had hoped to avoid. The Ordo Hereticus stood in full-throated support of the good Lord's suggestion that the war on Vrax should be brought to a swift end, and that the 88th should be enrolled within the services of the Inquisition. However, they did not agree that it should be enrolled in the Ordo Malus. Rather, they were of the opinion that the Ordo Hereticus should be granted control over the 88th. For this was, after all, at the heart of it, a question of heretical actions, specifically those of the renegade cardinal, much more so than the threat of demons that would normally be the purview of Ordo Malus. They argued that if they could do their duty correctly and swiftly, then Ordo Malus would have no reason to step in. Additionally, the Ordo Hereticus Witch Hunter's Arm and their Ordo Militant, the Sisters of Battle, were directly involved in this conflict due to the Heretic Cardinal's actions against his Sisters of Battle bodyguards. But Lord Hector was not overly fond of this idea. In his opinion, the Ordo Hereticus had had their chance, and he suspected they were the ones behind the assassination attempt on the Cardinal. Lord Hector also knew that it was indeed the Ordo Hereticus in particular that had lobbied so hard on behalf of the Adeptus Munistorum when it came time to decide the next leader of the 88th after the ousting of Lord Commander Jolker. Hector saw this as a little more than an ass-covering measure. The Ordo Hereticus had failed in picking up upon the renegade cardinal in time, and once they had figured out his true intentions, they had botched the assassination attempt as well. As far as he was concerned, the Ordo Hereticus was directly responsible for what was happening on Vrax right now, and he was worried that if push came to shove, the Ordo Hereticus would value their own reputation over the needs of the wider Imperium, and simply just pronounce exterminatus on the whole planet and the 88th alongside it. As far as Hector was concerned, the Ordo Hereticus had already cost the Imperium millions upon millions of loyal guardsmen in a war that never had to happen. He was not about to let them cost the Imperium millions more alongside an entire planet if he could help it. But whether or not he would be able to depended upon if he could convince the rest of the Conclave that his plan and his leadership was necessary. In preparation for this, the Seer Malifus and several other witnesses, along with evidence and corroborary testimonies, had all been prepared. Lord Hector's agents had also gotten a feel of how the other Inquisitors might vote, and it would appear that the Conclave was evenly split between supporting Hector's plans and supporting the Ordo Hereticus. It sounded then like a fair fight, but only fools and losers fight fair something Lord Hector Rex was more than aware of, and so, in his opening address to the Conclave, he went straight for the jugular, accusing the Ordo Hereticus of essentially failing the God Emperor's most holy mission, and stating that if the Conclave did not fully support his own motion, then defeat and failure were the only options left. 
This was quite the radical departure from the usually quite cordial tone at such conclaves. Uh, to put it into perspective, imagine standing up in a room and making a speech about your own plans, your political visions and your ideas for the future, and those listening to you are essentially all sentient thermonuclear bombs. And that's pretty much an inquisitorial conclave, as every single one of them has the full might and power of the God Emperor's most holy inquisition at their beck and call. Every last one of them can mobilize the full might of the Imperial Guard, the Imperial Navy, the astropathic choirs, or even request the cooperation of the God Emperor's Astartes. And with such a vast gathering of incredibly powerful individuals, you would be excused for expecting a certain level of decorum, since everyone would be very careful to avoid stepping on too many toes. But clearly, Lord Hector did not have time for careful. A long day of seemingly endless debates then followed, with evidence, testimonies, claims and counterclaims being thrown back and forth across the conclave. Lord Hector was playing a dangerous game. He had hoped that his ringing denouncement of the Ordo Hereticus actions would cause a few of the hardliners to take a step back and reconsider their position, and perhaps even more importantly, what their position might look like if they were overestimating their own capabilities. If they were unable to seize control of the 88th away from Marshal Gigori, and so far the Marshal had done an annoyingly good job of it, then ultimate responsibility would fall upon their order. They would have been the ones who started it, and also the ones to fail in finishing it. The other orders would have a field day blaming the Ordo Hereticus for every ill that followed. Perhaps it was best to take a step back, let Lord Hector have a crack at the problem if he solved it, all well and good. The Ordo Hereticus may have suffered a minor scuff in the paintwork, but nothing more. And if Lord Hector was to fail, then that would only be further proof that the Ordo Hereticus needed to step forth and take centre stage. And with the presumably previous failure of another Lord Inquisitor, and a protected general at that, the Ordo Hereticus was well insulated from any potential blame that an unsuccessful campaign might heap upon them. And so it was that Lord Inquisitor Balzac of the Ordo Hereticus decided to abstain, and taking their lead from their previous master, three other Inquisitors who had previously served under Lord Balzac also chose to abstain from the vote. This was just enough to allow Lord Hector's motion to pass by a measly two votes. If Lord Hector had hoped that his motion would have united the conclave behind him, he would most certainly be disappointed. But, despite the clearly fractured nature of the conclave, Hector had his mandate. And now he would have to follow up his coup in the conclave chamber with victories on the battlefield, to prove to everyone that he was indeed the correct man from the job, and to preempt any attempts on behalf of the Ordo Hereticus to seize the initiative. And the first step in ensuring battlefield success was not all that much different from the Inquisition compared to all of the previous people that had had to ensure battlefield success on Vrax, namely more dudes. It's just the quality and type of dudes that the Inquisition have access to are perhaps of an order of magnitude greater than that which most Imperial commanders have access to. And to exemplify this, Lord Hector Rex picked up the space telephone in 40k, that being a actual living, breathing human, and sent a message to Titan to gather up a strike force of Grey Knights under the command of veteran Captain Stern, to be dispatched immediately to Vrax aboard one of their strike cruisers. 
and feeling that he was still in need of more in the way of power armor, Hector Rex also made overtures towards other chapters. The Red Scorpions being one, since they had already been deployed to Vrax, they may be open for another deployment if the Inquisition modulated their language in the correct fashion and asked nicely. Another opportunity were the Dark Angels, but... <laughs> well, well, well. Even the most optimistic of Inquisitors know better than to count on the Dark Angels. But hey, might as well send off a telegram and see if they responded. The odds were not great, but it didn't cost Lord Inquisitor X over much to try. And the third chapter he contacted were the Red Hunters. The Red Hunters chapter is a rather unique space marine formation. There are rumours even suggesting that the chapter was formed and founded at the behest of the Inquisition itself. And if these rumours are true, it would explain the Red Hunter's extraordinarily close relationship with the Inquisition, even going so far as to bear the Inquisitorial eye upon their chapter icon, something that suggests that not only are they quite fond of the God Emperor's most holy Inquisition, but that the Inquisition too are very fond of them. And so the Red Hunter's assistance was virtually assured, leaving Lord Hector with at the very least a strike force of Grey Knights, along with the Red Hunters and a fairly likely contribution from the Red Scorpions. And as for the Dark Angels, yeah, shot in the dark, but hey, you never know your luck, might as well try. Regardless, power armor had now been well and truly secured. In addition, Lord Hector Rex would be bringing along with him 38 Inquisitors. This force was made up of the Lord Inquisitors, supporters and previous apprentices. Amongst the number would also come Hector Rex's own mentor, the venerable Lord Thor Malkin, a previous Protector General of the Skara Sector. The old man was, by all accounts, ancient at this point in his career, and this was likely to be his last campaign. But whilst his body may have turned fragile over the years, his mind was still sharp, and no one in the entire Skara Sector knew more about demons and their infernal kin than him. And along with the Inquisitors, and the mandate from the Conclave of Scarus, Lord Hector and all his following Inquisitors had access to all of the resources of the Scarus Sector's Inquisitorial forces. That of course meant that they could call upon a regiment's worth of Inquisitorial Stormtroopers if the need presented itself, as well as full access to the agents of the Officio Assassinorum. As for the division and deployment of these forces and the Inquisitors themselves, however, that might quickly become a bit more of a complicated situation. Fortunately, Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex was the Protector General. Thusly, he had authority to order the lesser Inquisitors about a bit, and so there was at least the vague outlines of a command structure. But by and large, the close to 40 Inquisitors would be divided up amongst the various siege regiments' headquarters, and they would have full authority to do whatever they wanted to do with the forces at their command. And if they wished to involve further troops, they would have to consult with the other Inquisitorial agents on planet as well. Essentially, this created a secondary system of command, which superseded the already in existence Imperial command structure. This could very easily become a bit of a recipe for disaster. Inquisitors tend to, and indeed have to, be very independent people. They are used to taking decisions without consulting with anyone else, and making snap decisions at that. Now, however, they would have to operate on a far larger battlefield, where one's individual forces may not always be sufficient. 
necessitating, obviously, a certain degree of cooperation. But it can be difficult to get dozens of highly individualistic people to cooperate with one another, especially as many of these Inquisitors were well, last hailing from more or less the same belief system and school of operation, may still have wildly different interpretations of any given situation. And since there was only one overall authority with the power to issue blanket orders to several formations and inquisitors at once, that could quite easily lead to some serious roadblocks where the various inquisitors may for one reason or another refuse to cooperate with each other. The old saying, too many cooks in the kitchen spoils the soup, could very, very easily come into play. But of course, it could also be to the army's benefit. Now every single regiment would have access to a shot caller, somebody that could mobilize the full resources and the reserves of the regiment at the drop of a hat, and could also draw in additional reinforcements from the inquisitorial reserves. This gave each regiment a much greater degree of action and manoeuvre than they had enjoyed previously, where they in many cases had been somewhat hidebound by high command. And in warfare, a quick decision swiftly reached is often better than a perfect one reached after hours of deliberation. The potential was of course also for the various Inquisitors to get in one another's way as they reacted to the same situation, but, well, Hector Rex would simply have to try and rein in the worst excesses of his subordinates until he could figure out which Inquisitors would work well alongside one another. As for the existing command structure of the 88th Army, it would by and large be allowed to remain intact. The only change would be to the absolute uppermost echelons of the 88's command structure, that of course being Marshal Arnim Kagori and his personal command staff. Now that Hector Rex had assumed a supreme command of the army, the Marshal either had to step down and await a further command to be handed to him by the Adeptus Munitorum, or he would have to submit himself to the authority of the Inquisition and transition from being the army's commander to being just one of its commanders. As far as the Marshal was concerned, the decision was simple enough. He had come to lead the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army to victory on Vrax, and if he could not lead it, then at the very least he would fight alongside his army until that final victory had been achieved. He offered to take command of one of the regiments, or even to take up a command of an individual company, if the Lord Inquisitor would allow him. On his part, Lord Hector Rex had nothing against Arnim Kagori. The Lord Inquisitor was of the opinion that the Marshal had done everything in his power, and the simple fact that it was no longer within his power to win the war was not his fault. And so he would allow the Marshal to travel to Vrax and take part in the combat directly as a regimental commander. He also authorised several members of Kagori's command staff to join their now quite beloved commander on the planet of Vrax. And with the somewhat distasteful task of relieving Arnim Kagori of his overall command of the army, Hector Rex now stood free to move his own command staff into the recently vacated headquarters on Thracian Primaris, and begin issuing his own orders to the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army, which now officially became part of the Ordo Malus. As for the reality on the ground for the guardsmen and the individual commanders, not a whole lot had really changed. The biggest difference was that now their orders came directly from the Inquisition, sealed in a special envelope with an inquisitorial eye emblazoned on the front of it. The biggest challenge for the Death Corps in all due likelihood would be getting along with their new friends. 
The various Inquisitors, now entrenched in the regimental headquarters, all brought along with them their own retinues of often highly unique characters. Personalities that were often quite at odds with the more dour outlook of the Death Corps officers. In addition, there would also be the odd Officio Assassinorum operative or Stormtrooper officer, butting in on the Death Corps' nice and spartan command centres. Hopefully there weren't any overly flamboyant characters, otherwise the rate of firearms accidents on Vrax might see a sharp uptick. But that was a problem for another day. The first priority was to secure the swift and immediate victory that Lord Hector Rex required to solidify his position in charge of the 88th Siege Army. This would be carried out by taking over an operation already planned for by Marshal Kagori. In the current situation, the 88th had almost completed another full surround of the Varaxian defenders. However, on the rightmost flank, the 30th Lion Corps' of forward momentum had been halted by the worshippers of Nurgle. And so, the Lord Inquisitor's first operation would be to break open this deadlock and complete the encirclement of the Citadel walls. And if everything went to plan, there might even be an opportunity to overrun the southern edges of the easternmost Citadel walls which would in turn leave the main Vraxian citadel dangerously exposed to an attack from the south. The Lord Inquisitor and his staff agreed that this was an optimistic possibility, but they also felt confident that they could carry out the operation to the utmost of their ability. And since the Grey Knight Strike Cruiser had already arrived in system, they felt confident that, albeit optimistic, it was an entirely reasonable goal. This goes a long way to show that for all his forward thinking, planning and understanding of the threat at hand, the Lord Inquisitor was still very new to the Vraxian theatre, and how it tended to treat optimistic estimates but I am sure the planet will be more than willing to teach its lesson soon enough. For now, let's have a look at the Lord Inquisitor's plan. The 30th Line Corps would make up the main assault force, deploying all four of its siege regiments, the 263rd, 262nd, 269th, and 261st in the main force. Additionally, the 7th and 11th tank regiments would be seconded to the 30th Line Corps for the duration of the offensive. Together, these troops would sweep southwards and clean up all of the Nurgle worshippers from the easternmost pocket, ending the resistance of the Chaos forces in the area and completing the surround of the Curtain Walls. And finally, the 308th Regiment of the 34th Lion Corps would push southwards from the breach, claiming the southmost portions of the westernmost curtain wall, and then begin moving eastwards towards the now claimed territories of the 30th Lion Corps. And this is where the optimism comes into play. Not only was the 308th Regiment expected to push southwards and out the enemy from the southernmost tip of the Western Curtain Walls, they were also then expected to push across the southernmost border of the inner Vraxian Citadel area and join up with the 30th Line Corps on the other end. This would see the 308th cross a distance longer than that expected of the 269th Siege Regiment of the 30th Line Corps, and the 308th did not have the benefit of armour, Inquisitor, or Astartes support. Undoubtedly, the Lord Inquisitor expected that since the Vraxian forces in the south were essentially isolated and in an exposed position, they would perhaps fall easily, surrender maybe even, and so the 308th would have no problems clearing them up. And afterwards, all they would have to do was cross an open area, right? 
It's not like the Vraxians had a long and proud history of massive, overwhelming, devastating counterattacks or anything. <laughs> of course not. It would all be entirely fine. <sighs> Besides, it wasn't like the 30th Line Corps wouldn't be there to help them a little bit if they needed it. All they would have to do is crush a large area filled to the brim with Nurgle worshippers, after which they'd have to then assault the Outer Curtain Walls to join up with 308th. Again, the Lord Inquisitor undoubtedly expected the enemy to simply abandon these positions if threatened from multiple positions. Of course, that's again based upon the assumption that they would be another threat from the 308th, and that the 30th would even make it there in the first place. Now, to be sure, this confidence was not entirely misplaced or plucked out of thin air. The 30th Lion Court had a full four siege regiments, supported by two armoured regiments. Additionally, it would also have the support of Inquisitors in the field, along with their agents and Stormtrooper elements. Potentially even Officio Assassinarum support, and high above in orbit hung the Grey Knight strike cruiser, the Honor Amentum. Being specially equipped to carry out the duties of the Grey Knights, it contained within it several teleportarum chambers, allowing the venerable old vessel to deploy several squads of Grey Knights anywhere on the battlefield within a moment's notice. This would allow the Grey Knights under the command of Brother Captain Stern to instantaneously respond to any demonic threat or to break open particularly entrenched centres of enemy resistance. Or if the unimaginable were to happen and the 30th in some way, shape or form might get in over its head, the Grey Knights could undoubtedly bail them out to its sweet. But still, there had been several commanders before Lord Hector Rex that had also been of the opinion that they had access to invincible numbers, undeniable firepower, and an unstoppable forward momentum. And Vrax had proved every single one of those commanders painfully wrong. And unfortunately, Lord Hector apparently was heading towards that very same fate. Overconfidence might just be his downfall, because not only was he planning for this major operation with the 30th Lion Corps, he was also preparing two further offensives upon the successful conclusion of the 30th's attack. This would be a very clear case of counting one's chicken before they've hatched. And the first of these chickens would be the first Lion Corps, who, with three siege regiments, would push forward up to the curtain walls, destroying any further outlying pockets of resistance between it and the curtain walls. The first was then to move into new positions, digging out trenches, bunkers and artillery positions, before preparing for an eventual assault upon the curtain walls. This operation was a bold and decisive one if it succeeded, or a foolhardy one if it failed, since its forward momentum relied entirely upon the 30th Lion Corps being there to secure the 1st Lion Corps' flanks. If the 30th was not there, then a full 75% of the 1st Lion Corps' forces would be dedicated to a major frontal assault towards the citadel walls, which would leave only a single siege regiment to resist any potential flank assaults made upon it by the Nurgle forces in the pocket. And to make things even more risky, the 46th Lion Corps would also carry out a similar operation towards the curtain walls, aiming to seize a strategic high point known as Hill 202 and then fortify it. Hill 202 being one of the most heavily fortified positions remaining outside of the curtain walls. The more observant amongst you may already have spotted the problem with all of this. 
if the 30th Lion Corps is to be fully committed to pushing the enemy in the east, and 75% of the 1st Lion Corps is to be committed to pushing up against the curtain walls, and the full might of the 46th is also to be committed, where are the reserves? And the simple answer to that is... There were none. If the 30th Lion Corps' forward momentum was to be stimmed, or oh God Emperor help us all, reversed, then the 1st Lion Corps' extreme flank would be left virtually completely undefended. The only thing that would stand in the way of a rapid riposte launched by the fetid followers of the Plague God would be a single siege regiment. And if it were to be overrun, the first line corps might find itself surrounded. With the Vraxian defenders to their front, and the Plague God's followers running rampant in their rear. The Lord Inquisitor was clearly impatient, and wished to push the war to a successful conclusion quickly before the worst case scenario could become a problem, but in so doing he was taking an awful risk. And he had better hope that his reinforcements were as good as he thought they were, because if his fellow Inquisitors and extra resources were not enough to guarantee the success of the 30th Line Corps, it might end very poorly indeed for the first. Whether or not the Lord Inquisitor had overplayed his hands, we will find out in the next episode. Until then, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day.